Chapter 4 You Can't Burn My Bear The next day I swallowed orange juice and broth. Soon I could eat small amounts of soft food such as oatmeal, tapioca, pudding, and jello. My chart still said no milk, but any time I asked for a milkshake, I got one. Within days I could swallow naturally without thinking about it, and nothing I drank came back through my nose. The deep, aching pain went away, and the muscle spasms stopped. It was easier to get my breath, too. The doctors decided to take me out of the oxygen tent for a while to see how long I could breathe on my own. My favorite doctor, a young blonde intern named Dr. Beavis, pulled back the plastic tent. I could see around me without everything looking foggy. Someone turned the crank at the foot of my bed, and the upper half of the bed raised up, putting me in a semi-sitting position. Page 38. The change felt wonderful. Breathe easy, Dr. Beavis said. Don't take great gulps of air. Relax. Pretend you're going to sleep. I closed my eyes. Because my chest muscles were so weak, my stomach, rather than my diaphragm, rose and fell as I inhaled and exhaled. Each time my lungs filled with air, my brain filled with excitement. I could breathe without the oxygen tent. You're doing great, Dr. Beavis said. Let's try it on your own. We'll keep the oxygen tent here in case you need it. I closed my eyes and grinned at him. I won't need it, I said. Later that afternoon... I watched joyfully as the iron lung was rolled out of my room. The next day, the oxygen tent was removed. I had won a major victory. I could breathe by myself. A nurse gave me more good news. I was moving out of isolation. Does that mean I'm not contagious anymore, I asked? That's right. Your parents won't have to put on gowns, masks, and gloves before they visit you. Page 39 Above her mask, her eyes smiled at me, and neither will I, she added. She opened a large bag and began dropping get-well cards into it. I had received dozens of cards and small gifts from family and friends. I had a faint memory of mother and dad holding up cards for me to look at through the oxygen tent and telling me who had sent them, but I had been too sick to pay attention. The window ledge and the bedside table were crowded with cards, stuffed animals, books, and a flowering plant. As I watched the nurse put a stuffed cat into her bag, I assumed she was moving my belongings to my new ward. This afternoon I'm going to have Mother read all my cards to me, I said. I was so sick when they came that I don't remember who sent them. You can't take these cards to your new room, she said. Why not? They're mine. Anything you had in this room gets burned, she said. Humming cheerfully, she dropped my new books into the bag. Page 40. Burned, I yelped. You're going to burn my books? I haven't read them yet. I don't even know the titles. She fished one of the books out of the bag and read the cover aloud. Anne of Green Gables. I want to read that one. I heard it's really good. I'm sorry, she said. We have to do this. It's the only way to be sure the virus doesn't spread. Back into the bag went Anne of Green Gables, followed by the plant and a box of candy. Those are mine, I shouted, feeling like a two-year-old whose toys were being snatched by a bully. You can't do that. I longed to leap from the bed and grab what was rightfully mine out of the nurse's hands. Just then, Mother arrived. I told her what was happening, certain she would make that unfair nurse give me back my belongings. To my surprise, Mother took the nurse's side. This has to be done, Peg. The hospital can't let something contagious leave this room. But she shook her head firmly, cutting off my protest. Dad and I knew when we brought your mail to you that this would happen. The nurses told us. Page 41 we brought it anyway because we hoped that seeing the cards and gifts would help you feel better when you were so sick. The nurse picked up the teddy bear that Art had sent me. Not my bear, I cried. You can't burn my bear. I'm sorry, the nurse said as she dropped Teddy into the bag. She sealed the bag with tape 
and with gloved hands carried it out of the room. The teddy bear that had sustained me through the worst week of my life was about to be cremated. I felt like I was murdering my only friend. You wouldn't want someone else to get polio just because you kept your teddy bear, would you, Mother said. No, I said. I knew she and the nurse were right, but I still didn't like it one bit. I sulked until I learned that moving out of isolation meant I could finally wear my own pajamas instead of a hospital gown. A different bed was wheeled in. After I was lifted onto it, a nurse stripped the sheets and blankets off the old bed and put them in a bag. Where do you take the bed to burn it? I asked. The beds don't get burned. They get sterilized. Page 42. Why couldn't my bear be sterilized? Why do you have to burn him? She didn't answer. I was rolled down the hallway to my new room, which I shared with a little boy in an iron lung. His name was Tommy, and he was eight. All I could see of Tommy was his head, which stuck out from one end of the iron lung and rested on a canvas strap, much like a small hammock. A mirror over his head allowed him a limited range of vision, but he was unable to see me. I was glad to have someone besides adults to talk to, but I wish Tommy were closer to my age, and I wish he were a girl. Since I was not able to get out of bed, I had to use a bedpan. I didn't want to do so with a boy in the room. Tommy told me that lots of people were able to breathe by themselves after being in an iron lung for many months. He was sure this would happen to him, too. Tommy's iron lung made a soft swish, swish noise as it helped him breathe. I found the noise soothing and went to sleep that night, pretending I was in a log cabin on a lake, listening to waves lapping the shore. Page 43. In the morning, I lay quietly, trying to match my breathing to the rhythmic swishing of the iron lung. As I did, I welcomed each breath I took, grateful that it could enter my lungs without assistance. Page 44.